There's a facility in Maryland, mostly used for housing military members and civilian workers, but in the past it was a testing ground, as people were exposed to some of the deadliest substances around. And the test subjects? American soldiers. It was the late 1940s and the United States and its allies were still sorting through the rubble after their victory in the Second World War. The two world wars had introduced a terrifying new element to warfare chemical weapons that could incapacitate, disable, or even kill soldiers simply by releasing a spray or gas into the battlefield. While the use of these weapons had decreased in the Second World War due to treaties, the Nazis had continued developing the deadly tools of war, and the United States wanted to understand them and how to stop them. The government obtained the formulas for a trio of nerve gases developed by the Nazis, deadly chemical agents that could interrupt the flow of signals between the brain and the body. These could have long-term debilitating effects and were more dangerous than many other chemical weapons, which were primarily irritants or caused respiratory distress. The gases, named Taboon, Soman, and the soon-to-be notorious Sarin, all had the potential to be fatal. At the Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, the government started doing tests on the gases and how to prevent and treat their effects. But there would soon be a shocking twist to these early tests. It was only 1948 when the government first started involving human test subjects in their experiments. While it doesn't seem any test subjects were exposed deliberately to these deadly gases, technicians were exposed to trace amounts, and the government learned a lot from these accidents. While the amounts the employees were exposed to wasn't enough to be fatal, it was more than enough to cause psychological distress, and that gave the government a potentially risky idea. What if the weapons could be refined into something less deadly, but still powerful? Luther Wilson Green, the technical director of a specialized division at Edgewood, published a classified report in 1949 about the possibility of psychochemical weapons. Based partially on the experiments that showed the psychoactive effects of the nerve gases in small doses, Green argued that this weapon could change war forever. What if instead of creating deadlier weapons that would leave carnage in their wake, the US developed chemical weapons that could cause mental incapacitation and end battles without a shot being fired? It wouldn't be long before the experiments took on new importance. Harvard anesthesiologist Henry K. Beecher was soon recruited to work on experiments at Camp King in Germany, working with many illegal drugs that could earn someone a hefty prison sentence for civilian use. Could LSD and mescaline have military implications? The government also interviewed former Nazi physicians to learn everything they could about these tools, and many in the military brass thought that these weapons could actually be more humane than bombs and other traditional weapons. But to find out, the government needed test subjects. It was 1948 when the government first authorized what would be known as the Edgewood Arsenal Human Experiments, a series of tests of chemical substances on human volunteers at their Aberdeen facilities. In total, they would experiment on around 8,000 people over close to three decades and test over 250 chemicals. Most would be mid-spectrum incapacitants, or drugs that cause a mental effect without much in the way of long-term physical consequences. For airborne gases, the government would use a wind tunnel to deliver the compound in a way similar to how it would be blown by the wind on the battlefield. Now the government just needed to get volunteers. While the use of human subjects in experiments on potential chemical weapons was controversial, the government tried to stay above board with how they conducted it. No enlisted men were ordered by their commanding officers to be parts of these experiments. Instead, the government conducted a series of recruitments at army installations. The soldiers would be shown a short film and given some handouts to explain the experiment, and those who showed interest were given a medical and psychological screening. The army wanted men who were healthy and able to withstand the effects of the compounds, but they also needed to be in the right frame of mind and know their limits. Men who were too enthusiastic and wanted to see how much they could handle were usually rejected, but those with an interest in science were prime recruits. It was surprisingly easy to get the men they needed. By the time the military had gone through 10 army bases, they would often be given four to 600 applications. They would be winnowed down to no more than 100, and these soldiers would be brought to Edgewood, where they would serve one to two months as a test subject. There were perks for volunteering, a small allowance, free weekends, and only light duty while volunteering. But it still wasn't for the faint of heart, because these test subjects would be spending some very unpleasant hours being exposed to substances that could cause chaos in large amounts. So what substances were tested? The government was particularly interested in the effects of popular drugs and if they could be weaponized. LSD, a psychoactive drug notorious for causing intense hallucinations and altered thoughts, was thought to be a potential way to send an opposing army into a panic. THC, one of the key components in marijuana, 
had no known lethal dose and was seen as a possible tool for slowing down enemy soldiers and reducing their aggression levels. The same goes for benzodiazepines, which lower brain activity and are commonly used to treat anxiety and insomnia. Making an entire army fall asleep would certainly be an effective tool in a war. But there was one drug that was considered of particular interest. BZ, also known as triquinylclidinol benzylate, is an odorless and stable powder that can survive a lot, even being spread by hot munitions. It can dissolve in most subjects and has powerful effects, including a state of delirium. Subjects exposed became confused, started to hallucinate, and found it challenging to perform even basic tasks. It can also cause some uncomfortable and distracting physical effects, including temporary blindness, a high heart rate, overheating, dry mouth, and skin disorders. But can it kill? Unlike many other chemical weapons, it has a very high lethal dose, with people needing to ingest around 450 mg to die from it, although testing is inconclusive. This makes it very different from other powerful chemical weapons which could wipe out an army or kill a scientist with a minor spill. BZ had the potential to change the face of warfare, letting armies win battles by rendering the opposite side mad as a hatter, red as a beet, dry as a bone, and blind as a bat, as a famous mnemonic put it. But this wasn't a drug invented for combat. BZ had actually been developed by a Swiss pharmaceutical company as an attempt to treat gastrointestinal ailments and ulcers, but it was repeatedly ruled out due to its severe host of non-lethal but highly unpleasant side effects. While it was quickly dropped as a drug, it was soon picked up by the US military for potential weaponization and was extensively tested on the Edgewood subjects. It even became the first chemical authorized for military use and was weaponized to be released by cluster bombs. But these plans would never be realized as the bombs were destroyed in 1989 when the government downsized the program. But BZ wouldn't be the only substance that the government would test on the Edgewood volunteers. Not all documents relating to the experiments are public, but the government did keep a detailed list of the time the volunteers spent on different subjects. Almost a third of volunteer hours were spent on incapacitating compounds, but another 14% were spent on riot control techniques. This likely became much more prominent in the 1960s as protests swept the nation. Sometimes typical crowd control methods didn't work, but the government didn't want to resort to lethal force. They needed to find compounds like pepper spray and tear gas that were non-lethal in most cases but can cause pain and discomfort, and usually send large groups running for cover and a place to wash their eyes out. Not all experiments involved direct exposure to chemicals. Sometimes the goal was to see how to avoid exposure. Some volunteers tried out new protective equipment and clothing. Others were subject to sleep deprivation to determine how well they could function under different circumstances. Some of these tests may have been combined, as the government was likely interested to see how the presence of drugs like BZ could impact mental performance on tests. The government even tested alcohol and caffeine's effects on soldiers. But for 14.5% of the hours at Edgewood, the tests took on a darker note. The roster is simply listed as lethal compounds, but it's believed that this involved some of the deadliest weapons ever created for war. This includes some of the deadly nerve agents like sarin that created the project, as well as the notorious mustard gas that burned the soldiers of the First World War. Industrial strength pesticides were also tested, but the US had no apparent intention of reintroducing any of them to the battlefield. So why did they introduce them in testing? Many of the tests involved nerve agent antidotes and reactivators, indicating that the US Army may have been trying to figure out how to best prepare for these substances if they were introduced in combat by an enemy. By testing them in small amounts and seeing how to bring soldiers back from the brink if they were poisoned, the government could equip its soldiers to survive a sudden chemical attack. But the government's secret testing ground would eventually come to an end. It was the 1970s when the government began investigating the program after more reports of long-term side effects of exposure began to surface. In 1975, the program was terminated and all the current volunteers were removed. The founder of the program, Dr. Van Murray Sim, had the run of the place for decades, but soon he had been hauled before Congress to testify before lawmakers, enraged that the government had been experimenting on soldiers. The army defended themselves, claiming that there were no serious injuries or deaths associated with the program. However, top brass did admit that their recruitment process may have taken advantage of the soldiers. But future investigations of the program's documents would tell a different story. Once all the documents were unsealed, the government took action to help the soldiers who had been exposed. Many had not even been told what substance they were being exposed to during the tests, simply being placed in a wind tunnel as a substance was blown toward them. It would have been difficult, if not impossible, for them to address any side effects they had from the chemical agents in the years after their testing. But for the first time, they had information and could seek help. While most of the tests were of irritant agents only, without side effects, the percentage who had been exposed to nerve agents or other lethal compounds were given extra attention. 
but for some, it might have been too late. The government would continue to investigate the experiments through 2004 and uncover the classified secrets. In the 1993 report, it was authorized to grant restitution to the families of test subjects who may have died of causes related to the experiments. But while over 7,000 test subjects were identified, the full number may never be known. And with decades passed since the tests, there's no way to investigate those who had died since for links to the experiments. But debates continue over the program's legacy. In the 90s, lawsuits were filed over the program by veterans' rights organizations, but they were initially dismissed. In 2013, a judge ordered the government to provide to test subjects with all information related to their well-being, but denied other claims of liability against the government. Psychiatrist Colonel James Ketchup, who worked with many of the subjects, denied most of the claims against the government saying that any who died during the test periods likely died of unrelated causes. Ketchum claimed that Edgewood was probably the safest military location in the world to spend two months. But for the soldiers staring into the wind tunnel as the unknown and potentially deadly came toward them, they might have had a different perspective. For more on the deadliest weapons of war, check out weapons even the military made illegal. Or check out why life of a World War I soldier in the trenches sucked for an in-depth look at the era of chemical warfare.